Hi out there in, uh, in FSHD University land. Uh, my name is Anna Gilmore. I'm uh, calling in from the FSHD Society. Um, and we're so excited to host this incredible panel today. Um, it will be moderated by uh, Jennifer Eggert, who is a clinical psychologist. She also happens to have FSHD herself and has several affected family members. Um, so she speaks from both professional and personal expertise. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for hosting us today. Thank you. It's really, it's, um, it's wonderful to be here. I'm really, really happy to be here. Oh, June, you're on. That's right. It's so good to see you. Oh, you're, you're muted, June. I'm sorry. I just came running up the stairs. Glad to be here with you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I, I won't put you on the spot then. <laughs> um, so I just I just want to say, you know, welcome to everybody. Um, this uh, this event today came about um, because um, June had been talking to a lot of people uh, throughout all of the different groups and individual conversations about this need uh, that people are having to figure out how to communicate about um, a whole host of issues that people with FSH deal with, how to talk to family about it, that people have been speaking in the support groups as well as one-on-one -on -one, um, about different challenges that they're facing. And June thought it would be a really good idea to try to put together really um, like a round table group. Uh, the purpose of which is, is I don't know how much we're going to solve all of the problems <laughs> that, that we face uh, today, but as, as a way to bring together people with FSHD, caregivers of people with FSHD, friends, family members, um, to have kind of a wide discussion about what people's experiences are, uh, what helps, what is difficult, um, and, um, you know, I think I, I did the same. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Some, can someone, um, I had mistakenly sent my link to somebody else and another family member just came in. Uh, so if you could remove that, that would be great. Anna, thanks. Okay. Um, so... Today, what we're going to do, I apologize, everyone. Today, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have this discussion amongst everyone here. We're going to go around. Different people are going to share some of their experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we're going to have a discussion uh, about the, the issues that are raised. So um, should we all first kind of briefly just say hello and introduce ourselves just to say our names and, and then we'll go from there. Sure, I'll start. My name is Dee Squire, and I live in Wanakee, Wisconsin. Hi, I'm Aura Prilaltensky, and I'm in Miami, Florida. Hi, I'm Renee Beaker, and I'm in uh, Bremerton, Washington. I'm Marissa Spain, and I'm in the Detroit, Michigan area. Hi, everybody. I'm Isaac Prilaltensky. I'm also in Miami. I'm Susan Freedy, and I'm in Jensen Beach, Florida, close to Miami, about two hours away. So glad to be here. Wonderful. So, uh, Dee, I think that you were going to kind of start us off today. Yeah, I'm a little bit of an open book, so I don't mind starting. Um, I'm 70 years old, and I um, was diagnosed when I was pregnant with my son. And um, my condition was very mild for the first, um, first oh, 28 years. And it has been more of a progression in the last um, 20 years. So um, we're talking about challenges with communication with regards to our family members in particular. And I've always 
sort of been my own advocate. I do not have a very large family. So I've always thought, uh, thought ahead and <clears throat> done things like gotten my lift chair in advance before I needed it. Um, just always um, made sure that I had what I needed to help with this condition. Um, but what I'm not very good at doing, because I'm very independent, I struggle quite a bit with asking for help. And um, part of it is that I'm in denial. Um, I worked until I was 66, so that was just till four years ago. And the reason I kept working is because I wanted sort of to pretend I, that I was normal and that everything was okay. And I've had people say that I make things look a little bit too easy, even though it's not easy. So I just kind of wanted to start us off and allow some of the, the rest of you to talk about some of your challenges. Thanks, Dee. Sure. Susan, um, I, yeah. Uh, I could I could tell uh, I could go next if you like, and I could just tell you that um, I'm kind of similar. Um, I I didn't get diagnosed when I was young. I guess I had the weakness all my life, but I never I didn't ever receive my um, you know my gen genetic you know actual test till I was 50. I'm now 74. Um, I, I like some of the others, I didn't progress till later in life as much. I, I mean, I had a little bit, but I got around pretty well. I worked, I took care of my family, my children, I even took care of grandchildren. But um, as time went on, you know, little things kept going and going and I became weaker and weaker. And uh, now the last the last, like, like others have said, I'd say the last 10 years, my decline has been really rapid. Um, falls, I had frequent falls. I was standing. I was able to um, transfer. But after the last fall I had, which was three years ago, I have not been able to stand at all. So now I'm in my chair full time and then the Hoyer lift. So my life now is basically, you know, 12 hours in the day in my chair and then go to bed and in the bed 12 hours. And just, um, you know, that's just me. I've, I've been pro progressing and having a lot more pain, a lot more weakness. And, you know, it takes a toll emotional. Your your family always see you as the active person. And, and now I'm not. <laughs> it, it is difficult. It's very difficult. So, um trying to get help and people to not think that, you know, you're just being a baby. That's hard for me because otherwise if I'm not, if I'm not situated in my bed, right, if I'm not set right, my pillow's not right, my neck, my back, my hips now in terrible pain. And I don't think people really realize that. So, so anyway, that's all I was, you know, had to say and would want maybe somebody has some thoughts on it. Susan, are there communication issues like you about how you communicate with your family about these needs? A little bit, yeah. I, I have I have caregivers in the morning, which that part's fine. They get me up and showered and, and ready for the day. But then like now in the afternoon, it's just my husband and myself. And um, it's hard for him at night. He's trying to help get me in bed and doing all those tasks and it, it's difficult, and as time goes on, I require more and more. And if I try to ask, it's sometimes considered like I'm being naggy or I'm trying to pick a fight or, you know, that type of thing. It's just I just want to be comfortable. And as far as my children, um, one, I have one here, but one lives in another state, and they're busy with their own lives. They'll help me with you know, other stuff, but not the hands-on type of stuff. You know, they would, they'll say, well, we'll try to figure it out. But as far as them ever coming and seeing exactly what I go through in a day, just to even get up, they don't really know. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Is there someone else that wants to go next to share a little bit about 
I can go next. Yeah. Um, my name is Renee Baker, and I live in Bremerton, Washington. As I said, I was diagnosed um, first at the age of, I had three misdiagnoses and finally got the, the full, the real diagnosis at the age of 26 after I'd had my daughter. Um, I didn't think that I had the disease. I knew it was autosomal dominant. I knew that every pregnancy had a 50-50 chance, but I didn't think that I had the disease when I got pregnant with my daughter. So I, I, I carry a little bit of a chip on my shoulder for that. Um, I currently live with my son, who's 36. I always want to make him older, but he is 36. Um, that came to be when I fell in the bathtub, and I had to, thank goodness, I had my Alexa in the bathroom, and I was able to reach out to Gavin because I probably would have died. I would have strangled myself in the bathtub had he not been able to come over and help me. And at that point, he said, you know what, Mom? I think I probably should move in and help you. Mm -hmm. So I, I am very blessed. He's he's really wonderful. We have had to learn how to communicate um, and be a little bit, I have to be more open because I'm like a couple of the, the two preceding women. I, I'm very, very independent and I want to do things myself and I like doing things my own way. I'm divorced. I've been divorced um, after 23 years of marriage. I've been divorced 23 years. Um, I like to do things my own way, but I do really appreciate my son helping me. Um, I'm in, I can walk. I walk from my chair to the bathroom and back to my chair, but otherwise I'm in a wheelchair all day long. Um, so I, I'm really, I, I really have to be very cognizant about how I request things, how I share things so that I, because I can be a little bit intimidating and that's not what I want to do. So I'm learning, I'm learning, Gavin's learning. I have a number of uh, family members who also have the disease. Um, and my, my mom is of the era where you, if you don't say it, it's not true. And if you fight it, you'll never have it. Um, so that, that's been quite a bit of a challenge for me. I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 40 years. Um, I've done everything, quality education, all the different uh, unit types. So communicating and accepting is, is important for me. It's not so much for her. So I've had to learn that this is her coping mechanism. It's not yours, Renee, it's hers. So, you know, learning what everybody, how people think and what they are able to assimilate and cope with is what I struggle with, um, with communication and being aware of. You know, Renee, you said you and your son have had to learn how to communicate. I, I wonder, wonder if you could just say a little uh, something about that. Um, sure. So um, if I see him doing something, and bless his heart, he'll say, ah, the sins of the father once again, we are their ugly heads. <laughs> if it's something that I dealt with in my marriage and I think, oh, I, I can't do that again. I'm not dealing with that again. And Gavin will just say, you just need to talk to me about that, Mom. I don't have to do it that way. So I have to learn how I present myself. If I have a need, I need to uh, approach it appropriately. A lot of I statements, very few you statements. Um, sometimes when you get frustrated because, you know, I used to be able to do that yesterday. I could reach the toilet paper yesterday. I could reach the Kleenex yesterday. I could reach the spoon, yada, yada, yada. Today I can't do that. So I have to... Um, remind myself not to take my frustration out on whoever's trying to help me. Or, you know, I have a number of dear friends who, who like to help, and I have to be very cognizant of not taking my frustration out on the people around me that love me. It's That's an easy one to do, but not very productive, as you all know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also like what Dee said, the struggle for asking for help. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk more about that after we all sort of have um, this opportunity to speak. Who who would like to communicate? I don't know. Maybe Isaac, you want to talk from a caregiver perspective? And well, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you all for having me. Uh, it's always a treat to hear people's perspectives and people speaking from the heart. So I really appreciate that very much. Um. To put this in context, Ora and I have been married for 41 years. 
uh, and a great deal of what I've learned about communication, I learned from Aura. <laughs> I used to be a little bit conflict averse, even though I'm a psychologist. Um, that was the feedback I received during my training, that I was conflict averse. I wanted everything to be nice all the time. Uh, but I learned with Aura that it's okay to express our respective needs and the world doesn't crumble if if we have differences of opinions. Um, so some of the things from the perspective of a person who doesn't have FSHD but is affected nevertheless, right? I don't have it physically, but it's a family affair. Um, so I can share a little bit about doesn't what didn't work for me and what works for me. And I know that what doesn't work is rumination and just being in my own head. Um, you know, maybe ruminating about my own needs and uh, what I want or what I need and that doesn't help, you know, to live in your head. <laughs> so with Aura, I've learned that it's okay to put things out there and to have a conversation. And I I think um, with Aura, we've learned, both of us, to have bifocal vision, <laughs> which is to think about ourselves and to think about the other person at the same time. And I think that really helps. So when I when I have a need from my perspective, uh, how can I say it in a way and a time and a place and a space that is more conducive to have a good conversation? And I admit that sometimes I sit on things maybe longer than I should. Uh, just to find the right time. But I think it's really important for me to find the right time and place. And I think a lot about how can I use this bifocal vision. So I think about what I need, but I also think how it's going to land uh, and how the other person will receive it. And just to, to put it in a little bit of... Uh, psychological terms, I think, or I wrote a book about this, so I guess I can talk about it in public. We wrote a book, a book about mattering. And I think a good relationship is when we both feel valued, we help each other feel valued, and we help each other add value uh, to contribute. So, I'm very lucky that Ora contributes a ton to my life, to the family life. And I try to contribute what I can. Um, so these are the things that help us, you know, this bifoc bifocal vision, thinking, what do I need? How is it going to land? I think communication is very emotional because whatever we say can either make the other person feel good or feel bad. <laughs> and it's the, the art in communicating, I, I feel, is just to find the right words so that I can express my needs without putting the other person on the defensive or without affecting each other's dignity. So um, that's what I want to say for now. Yeah, there, there's so much in, in what you're um, saying, Isaac, that I think is so critical to what what we're really facing here about like, you know, that it's fundamentally difficult in general to communicate with the people that we love. And that particularly when emotions are intense, um, it's very disorganizing. Yeah. And it's really hard <laughs> to keep that, I love that. I'm going to use that. I'm taking that from you. That bifocal, that bifocal vision. I, I'm going to. Uh, I'm gonna. You know, I'm gonna. I'm gonna uh, borrow that for sure. I'll give credit. I promise. But <laughs> it's um, because in those times when emotions are very intense and really high, uh, 
sometimes we're not even aware of what are, what's going on inside of ourselves, let alone what's going on for the other person. We're just in this complete reactive state, which makes it really difficult to have effective communication. And I think that speaks a lot to like, you know, when is the time to have these conversations? Is the time to have the conversation when we are in the heat of it? Or is it, you know, at a time to have some of these really difficult conversations when, um, when it's on a little bit more neutral ground, uh, you know, or I don't know if you want to follow up just because sure. I think it would be a good, you know, you're following up on, you know, what Isaac has said in your experience in it. Yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. So my situation is I was diagnosed at age 18, but really the symptoms started much earlier. I probably today I'm 64 years old today. I probably would have been, diagnosis early onset. So by the time Isaac and I met and then married, I think we were 23 when we married, I was already, I mean, I was walking. So if you just, somebody who didn't know me may not have known at a first glance, but certainly I couldn't run anymore. There were limitations. And um, at this point, I've been using a chair for oh, many years. At this point, there's been a, a real decline in the last few years. It's affecting my breathing as well. So um, I would say that Isaac and I have, Isaac has always been um, providing a lot of care and support. But over the last two years, I would say two or three years, our lives have become a lot more interdependent. That kind of dance of as my needs have intensified. And like um, I think Dee mentioned uh, the thing about asking, difficulty asking for help. So I was definitely one that outside the home wanted, to, wanted it to seem like everything is easy and I can work and I can teach and practice and do all those things. But I think Isaac always knew because that's why it was safe at home. So you could see that it wasn't so easy. And, um, you know, that bifocal vision, again, that Isaac has used, I think what has guided me really, guided both of us, is that need. Because in a relationship, it's not just care and support cannot just go one way, which is why I never liked the term caregiver, to say that Isaac is my caregiver, because I think I also... I mean, he does an awful lot of caregiving, but I have a responsibility to care for him as well. I have because he's my, there's reciprocity. And that really, I think that that bifocal vision is what keeps, um, ensures that we take each other's needs into consideration, which is just so critically important. Mm -hmm. And I think just, in terms of difficult conversations. And we've def definitely had to have some more difficult conversations about how to meet needs, who else needs to step in so Isaac can have some space and do things that he, you know, it's like in the past when he was able to go mountain climbing here and there. I couldn't do that, of course, but he, he still needed to do that. So how do we meet my needs and give him space so he can replenish? But I think what enabled us to have all kinds of conversations is just building a strong foundation of, with a lot of, of positivity and care and friendship. And I think that the more, the stronger the foundation of that, of that relationship, the easier it is to deal with more difficult situations when they come up. If I may, Jen, I just want to add one thing about what Ora said, mm -hmm. and what you said earlier about reactivity. You know, there are so many interactions during the day when you feel like, hey, you know, like you want to react. You say, no, I don't like this. Or why did you say that? Or what's wrong with you? Or what? Ah. <laughs> And I think, I think God is really very, very good 
uh, what our friend Don Meikenbaum, the great psychologist, would say, edit. You know, edit your response. You know, like, mm -hmm. don't say the first thing that comes to your mind. Just, you know, <laughs> like, sit on it, let it slide. Don't sweat the big stuff. And I think we've learned to do that because there are so many opportunities when there is close interaction all day long when things can go awry, you know, like maybe I did something wrong or maybe you didn't express your need well. And I think we've learned just to let it go, let it slide. Mm -hmm. You don't need to make a big deal of every little thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, it's a very useful strategy. Just, mm -hmm. it's like press the pause button, you know, don't respond, don't react. And then collect yourself, and there will be a time to talk about things. Uh, it, it reminds me of um, Tara Brock, who is a, a Buddhist mindfulness teacher. She talks about the sacred pause. Um, that you know, it, and uh, you know that just by allowing ourselves a moment to really pause, then there's an opportunity for a different way of responding. It's like the difference between reaction and response right. is, is a pause, as it was. And sometimes that pause can be 10 seconds, and sometimes that pause can be 10 hours, 10 days, hopefully not 10 years. But, um, <laughs> you know, that, that, and, 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 you know, I'm also thinking, I mean, I, I, you know, it's funny, I was speaking with a, psychologist friend of mine we were talking about something that was really difficult that you know we were facing and um and how intense all of the emotions were and how to negotiate all the intensity of the emotions and then i was thinking about it, and think about it you know we're not uh civilians like thinking about okay so both of you are psychologists not only, so you have all of this knowledge and experience about communication, about emotions, all this sort of stuff, myself as well. And, and think about all of that education, all of that experience, all of that working with people around these things, around communication, emotions. So, you know, we're in the trenches with this every single day. And then for the majority of people, they're not in the trenches with dealing with these things every single day. And so how do we... Uh, like or said these are difficult conversations like you know it, this is it this is it, being human and trying to negotiate any any relationship for, forget about F, fshd for a second you know there are challenges and how can we have some compassion for ourselves um in the middle of all of that uh ways in which that we are gonna I don't like the word fail, but ways in which we're not going to re respond in the ways in which we wish, ways our, our, the people in our lives are not going to respond in the ways we wish, and then coming back with a willingness to revisit this again and, and to try again and to try to work. It's really we're in a place of creation when we are finding a way to communicate with the people in our lives and to communicate our own needs. Um, and just having that that awareness um, in the middle of this all, um, Marissa. I think you're you're the last of the panelists that hasn't yeah. had a chance to speak. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot that I could say about communication, um, but I'll just start out by saying I love listening to Isaac and Orr talk about their relationship. Um, it reminds me a lot of my own marriage. Um, young in comparison, I'm 27. We've only been together for a, a mere 13 years. So uh, very uh, <laughs> short compared to their 41 plus. Um, but what they say about having a basis of friendship and coming at everything from a positive light, it just it really resonates with me. So I love listening, hearing them uh, talk about their relationship. Um, but I guess I'll talk about about uh, my experience as someone with early onset, like I said, I'm 27. I've been a wheelchair user for five years now. Um, and I have a little bit of a different story to most people I'm finding out in the community in that I um, have a long, long family history of knowing that we have FSHD. So I think we can trace it back five generations in my family. So I've always known, so I don't have a diagnosis story. Um, 
And I had early onset, my parents said that um, by the time I started walking, they knew that I had it. Um, my dad also had early onset. I think from the limited stories I've been told, and we'll get to that, um, I think he started having symptoms around middle school, like seventh grade. Um, and my grandfather had it, my great grandfather had it. You know, it, went, it went up the line. So I've always known that I had it. And so I would say that the biggest thing that comes to mind for me when I think about communication in my past is how talking about my condition and my father's condition was talked to me about when I was a kid. And I, I don't know if my dad is listening, um, but uh, I very much believe that, you know, we do the best we have with the information that we have at the time. And when my father was raised, it was, you know, in the 70s and 80s was very much like the mindset of someone mentioned earlier, if you don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. Um, and so that was the model that he had. That's so that's how he raised me. So growing up, we we didn't really talk about it. Um, and if we did talk about it, you know, it was never with dad, always with mom, you know, hushed tones. Uh, you didn't really face it head on. And I think that really impacted how I saw myself and how I saw my future. And it wasn't until I was able to really become involved with the disability community online that I was able to, you know, gain the information that they didn't have, which is that, you know, this is okay. It's okay to talk about this. We need to communicate about this. Um, we're not doing ourselves any favor by keeping this conversation in the shadows. So in the last five, six, seven years or so, we've really been starting to have that conversation about, you know, with each other, me and my dad. We've had so many conversations that wouldn't have been possible before I was introduced to this mindset online of being open to talking about it. And it's been a really fantastic period of growth, I think, for both of us. Um yeah, so I guess my message to, you know, any parents with kids with early onset, um, if you're affected or not yourself, or maybe if there's some younger people listening who have early onset, is just like the conversations that you're going to have might be, you know, because I think we're all kind of in this mindset of like, well, we can't talk about this, like disability is bad. Like it, you wouldn't catch me saying the word disability 10 years ago. Um, and now I like make it my mission mission. Like I have my own online platforms where I talk about my life living as a disabled person. And that's been the biggest thing of growth for me. So I think that, you know, those conversations are going to be uncomfortable when you start out, but I, I think it's necessary because it, it helps you communicate your needs, accept yourself, realize that this isn't a shameful thing. And I think there's a lot of power in that. And especially as, you know, someone who had a great deal of physical abilities stolen from them at a young age, um, it took a lot of my power away. So I think having that conversation is a really great way to take it back. Mm -hmm. You know, Marissa, could, would you mind sharing a little bit about like, how, how was it that your parents responded to sort of this new way of approaching talking about these things? How was, how would they respond? Yeah. Um, very, very openly. You know, my, the weirdest thing for me about having learned this mindset from my parents is that they are the most open, most wonderful, inclusive, inviting people that you will probably ever meet. Mm -hmm. um, and yet they were still, you know, except everyone kind of except yourself <laughs> uh, was kind of the, you know, like, I had friends with disabilities growing up and it was, it was always, you know, include these people, these people matter. And yet we still couldn't have that conversation ourselves. Um, so I, um, it seems to be in my family that it's progressing faster earlier. So I started using a wheelchair or I, I made the leap to get my first mobility device um, when I was 19 years old. And I remember sending this like really dramatic emotional email to my parents because I needed their help to purchase it um, about like, it's not about giving up. It's about doing what you need to do for yourself to continue living the life you want to live. 
And they were nothing but supportive of that. They, you know, my, my dad came with me to help me test the mobility scooters and they, they helped me purchase it. And along the way, whenever I make a step further in my, you know, physical and emotional journey, um, as someone with a progressive disability, they've always been supportive. They've always been, you know, very vocal about how proud of me they are. Um, and, but it's been a little bit more difficult just because that internalized ableism is, ableism is so ingrained. Um, it's been a little bit more difficult to get my dad to go on the same kind of journey that I'm going on mm-hmm. and, you know, accept that, you know, maybe it's time to start using a cane, dad. Maybe it's time to start using a wheelchair, dad. Like, look at all these things that I'm doing now that I use it. Join me. Step into my web. <laughs> um, and he is an, and I know it's a very difficult journey for him because of how he was raised, because of the messages he's gotten from society all of his life. Um, but they've been, we're getting leaps and bounds from where we were when I was a kid, as far as like talking about it with each other. Mm-hmm. And it's been wonderful. Hi, dad, if you're listening, I love you. <laughs> yeah. And you know, we know everyone has their own journey, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, and- it's difficult for me to remember. Sometimes I have to take deep breaths. <laughs> and someone said earlier about remembering that, okay, that's mom's coping strategy, not mine. Right. Uh, that I have to remember everyone's at their own part in their journey and just right. great. <laughs> you know, and, you know, coming back to um, Isaac's, you know, this idea of this bifocal lens, it's true about this too. Everyone's got their own journey. You know, I come also from a family of FSHD. Both of my aunts have it. Uh, My father had it. My father passed a few years ago. And I remember growing up, I was so frustrated with him because he refused to use a cane for a long time. He refused to use a walker. He refused to get his scooter. And, I, you know, this is when I was much younger. And it was before I was diagnosed, I was I was diagnosed I guess in my early 30s, although I kind of knew that I had it at the in the late 20s because I was having shoulder issues and, you know, what else is it going to be if people in your family have it? Um, so I remember being so frustrated with him because I felt like, oh, my God, if you would just get a scooter, your whole world would open up. And that's how I felt, you know, when it was, and I was to get so frustrated with him. I eventually did get the scooter when it was his time, you know, and then, and then here it was this year, I found myself, um, last year was a, a period of a lot of decline for me. And I was, I was, here I was, I was my father. I was so resistant. <laughs> I was like, I was like, you know, I shouldn't have this. I shouldn't, you know, do this. Um, and it was interesting to be able to have that bifocal uh, perspective. You know, I, I wish I could have the conversation with him now and tell him that. Um, but, you know, it's true. And how can we just sort of be patient with other people in their own and know that we're, we can be models for people and uh, and we could be understanding that, you know, we understand that this is this whole journey. There's there's so much of what we discuss, and, and one of the questions that's really like sort of sticking out for me, you know, D started us off, and I'm sorry, D, I was like a little like dealing with the, the people, okay. and, but you you started us off about you know I you know I'm so independent, and and this question is coming to me. I was like, what what gets in the way for us to be able to communicate, to be able to ask for help? to be able to communicate our needs, to be able to say, and we've touched on it in every, you know, with everyone talking, but I I just, I guess I'd love to, you know, put it out there to everyone about like, you know, what is it that you feel really gets in the way of communicating effectively about uh, FSHD with friends, family? You know, Jenna, I I think, what I would say to that yes. is that I think that it, as a society, we tend to almost worship independence, right? It's like to be independent, it seems to be some, you know, one of the greatest uh, things that people 
aspire to? As though anyone is really, truly, <laughs> truly independent. I mean, we really are all interdependent. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody could really go it along, alone anyway. Yeah. But I think we've, I would say that we feel it more acutely. Uh, that, so I think that it's almost like this fear, I think, for me anyway, was that by, by um, kind of admitting that I need help, it was almost like a loss of dignity that would be perceived as a loss of dignity. And that why it was just such a difficult thing to do. I see it as, a, as myself being less than, because I need help, because I'm unable to do X, Y, or Z. I'm not able to participate with X, Y, or Z. I'm from a very big family, and there's lots of activities, most of which I cannot do any longer. Um, and I have a, a, a big challenge of trying to explain that to them. So it makes me feel less than. So I'm going to mm-hmm. put my bifocals on and um, try mm-hmm. and, and work on it from, you know, I, I've tried many different um, avenues to try and promote that we can all do things differently and it's okay. It's really okay. Um, but yeah. Right. Yeah, take I was going to say I, pride came to my mind. My, it was my first word that came to my mind when you asked about this. I think um, being independent, and I was very independent at a very young age, at age 18 on my own. And so I've always been really prideful that, you know, I was on my own and I worked and and all of that. But I love the bifocals. Um <laughs> I love that. So I'm going to, that's a, a big takeaway for me, Isaac mm-hmm. and, or, and Dora. I loved um, it when Dora just... used the word. Oh, go ahead. I loved it when Aura used the word interdependence. Um, and yeah, I agree. I think that we put way too much emphasis on independence when we're really, you know, we're all interdependent. Like even people without disabilities, like we're interdependent on people to grow our food and heat our houses and things like that. Um, I just wanted to share a really, I I think there's so much to so much like depth of humanity to gain through being interdependent with people. And I wanted to share a short example. So um, last night I was making spaghetti for dinner and um, I had the pot to boil the spaghetti on one of the back burners and I was um, making like chicken or something on the front burner. And so with my weakening triceps, I couldn't, like lift my arms out to and yes i'm a heathen who splits the spaghetti in half so i couldn't uh get my arms over to the pot in the back to split the spaghetti and put it in without like spraying like raw spaghetti all into the thing i was cooking on the front burner and so my husband was standing there and i was like hey can you come be my triceps for me and he was like do you want me to just do it i'm like no 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 just 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 lift my arm and so he just like supported my right elbow as he lifted it over the stove so I could break the spaghetti into the pot. And I was like, oh, thank you. And then he left. Um, so, and, and that was really, that just, it made me a little bit giddy. I was like, oh, that was fun. <laughs> so uh, I think when we think of like a caregiving, it's usually like, it seems like a very heavy conversation, but it can be, and it certainly can be, um, but it can be just like, you know, little things like that. Like I was making him dinner and he was being my triceps and it can be a fun and, relationship deepening experience it doesn't have to be this weightful stressed thing yeah and it's also raising this question for me is like you know you know or you say uh was it you or that said like we worship independence is that what it was yeah um and it made me ask the question of like well what is independence is is it independence from your wheelchair to go about your day uh, and need someone to help you with a curb cut or uh, or be your bicep or tricep for a moment as you're cooking dinner. Is that not independence? And I think we can have these pictures in our head. So when we think about like what gets in the way. So Part of, you know, what I'm hearing, you know, um, you know, what what Dee was saying, you know, about pride and everything, you know, there are these themes of shame and burden. Mm -hmm. 
those of us that are ashamed of uh, that, that we don't fit whatever this picture is of uh, independence or what a model of um, an independent, capable, and functioning adult should look like, right? And first of all, I mean, the question is like, you know, who defined that model anyway? Um, who is the they that we're talking about? <laughs> Um, which is, you know, a huge question um, beyond the scope of <laughs> our discussion today. But, but these these messages that have gotten very deep inside of us, whether they were put inside of us by these sort of societal uh, images of able uh, ability and and disability, or or as was communicated by family, by not talking about something, that this is something shameful, like Mercy, you're talking about, that these sort of indirect ways that it's communicated, that somehow this is less than, and um, developing this sense of shame for needing. And the reality is, is every single human being on earth needs from other people. The This interdependence that, you know, aura, Isaac is talking about this is how we function. Again, if you take away FSHT, what we're talking about is fundamentally what it's like to be a human being, that we depend on other people, that we have to communicate about different things, that we all have aspects that make us feel ashamed or make us feel like a burden on somebody else. Um, but here we are with FSHD, and then there's these really unique challenges where perhaps if FSHD wasn't there, we wouldn't need the same kinds of things from other people. We would need other things from other people and other people would need things from us. But with FSHD, you know, as Marissa was saying, you know, we need somebody to be our, our bicep or our tricep. I think mm -hmm. we were talking about this before I had given this image of like, you know, these exoskeletons that they use, like that these people around us can become our exo exoskeletons. And if we can't reach for something that someone does it for us and it's not our body, it's their body. And so we have to negotiate the fact that someone is an extension of our body sometimes. Uh, and yet Yet there, there's also this very independent, independent person. Um, so this, you see how negotiating shame. Like if we didn't, you know, there's there's a really uh, interesting writer. Her name is uh, Byron Katie, who uh, talks about you know loving what is. Um, her book is very pow powerful, and she asks the question of people because she really challenges people's stories about things. Like, you know, so we have the story that I'm a burden to somebody else. We have a story that independence looks a certain kind of way. And then she asks the question is, who would I be if I didn't have that story? How would I communicate if I didn't have that story? So if I didn't have the story that my independence as I am is somehow not good enough? How would that change the way I would communicate about my needs? How would it communicate? How would that change the communication about what my feelings are and how I allow myself to be vulnerable with, with the people around me? And I think mm -hmm. that that's a very interesting question. Jen, and I think we can learn to create other stories. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking what I related so much what Marisa said about caregiving moments can be light yes. and, and, and finding relation, even relationship building and deepening. Because I know that, you know, at this point, I mean, Isaac feeds me because as of uh, six months ago, I couldn't lift my own arm with a spoon to reach my mouth so you know so we have so many of those moments not only isaac we, we also i also have some some caregiving at home from uh from uh official caregivers but he still does an awful lot most of it but these are many we have many great conversations as we're doing some of those things and we laugh a lot and have fun and it doesn't have to be this serious, now I'm doing this for you. So that's really something to keep in mind. 
humor can definitely be a great way to sort of cut through, cut through. June, you're going to... Yeah, I, I, someone wrote into us ahead of time uh, with a story they wanted to share share on this webinar. So I wanted to make sure we got that. And I think it touches on this shame issue. But anyway, to, to condense the story, this individual um, was suffering, you know, ha was experiencing symptoms of FSHD, but did not get diagnosed until she was 32. And at that time, suddenly learned that her mother had it and they had never told her. So she had um, been going through the symptoms and the family, the parents could have saved her, you know, a lot of um, not knowing and not, but, but they just didn't tell her. And she's finding it very hard to continue to have a relationship with her parents because they had kept this information from her. Um, and I wanted to share that because I've heard other people have similar experiences. Um, and, you know, she has support from her spouse and friends, but her parents, her mother who has FSHD, obviously not as heavily affected, they won't even acknowledge that she has it or ask her how she's doing. Um, and so she's saying, how do you deal with a family member who just isn't at that level of denial, I think? Um, and how is there anything she can point her parents to? And I think this was telling too that she ha already has a lot on her plate dealing with this recent diagnosis and how it's going to affect her life. And I think she resents that she's almost being forced to take on the extra burden of trying to get her parents to understand. I think there's a lot to say, and I think there's a lot that other people on this panel might also contribute. Um, I, first of all, I want to say I'm so sorry that that's your experience because mm -hmm. it's, it's really painful. It's really painful. And from the bifocal perspective, um, people avoid things because they don't feel like they have the capacity to deal with it. Um, and that that's that's very hard, especially when you're trying to figure this out and having the support of family would be sort of so kind of enormously helpful. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm a big supporter of people um, seeking out family therapists, individual therapists that might be able to help facilitate some of these discussions that can be hard for people to to take on on themselves and how to how to break through that and in the meantime there are so many resources that you that we all have to take advantage of because even with the support of family it is our journeys and we have to figure things out um and kind of like you know marissa and i'll maybe I'll turn it over to Marissa, but, you know, Marissa, how you spoke about it is that, you know, it wasn't spoken about when you were growing up. It wasn't a secret, but you found your way and your way of support. And then you became the model about how things were going to be dealt with going forward. Um, I don't know if you have other thoughts on, on this. Sure. Um, well, I think for me, I'm, in a, in a bit of a different situation to this person and that my parents were, my dad in particular was very receptive of the new perspective that I brought yeah. to their lives. It was, like I said, they did the, their best that they could with the information they had at the time. And when that information changed, now we're changing the way we do things. Um, but I think it's really important. There's a, a word that, that I love um, that I haven't heard thrown around a lot, which is uh, ableism internalized ableism um and internalized ableism if you've not heard of it is is that the, the ableism is the the um the you know is where the, the shame comes from it's how we look down on disabled people in society and people with differences and challenges and to internalize that is to turn that perspective onto yourself and i think that is and, you know, in, in the world that the older generations grew up in that, you know, and I, I say that as someone who's 27, you know, is pre, if you're in America, it was pre-ADA, it's 
for the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was back when disabled people were institutionalized and there were literally laws that said, hey, if you are unseemly or disabled, you can't be in public or you'd be arrested. So like that's kind of the mindset that a lot of older generations grew up in. And so they still have. I think we need to remember that when speaking to them about this. I, I know I do because, you know, I'm in this more progressive mindset of of today where being disabled is something you can be proud of. And that's a mindset we can raise our children with now, whereas back then it might not have been safe. So I think maybe introducing some of the bigger concepts to them of like how society deals with disability in general to kind of, because that's what helped me understand was understanding the structures of society around you that have led you to feel this way. Like you're not inherently bad. There is no moral failing in being disabled. It's just, that's what you've been taught. So that's probably would be my advice would be, and they might not be receptive and you might have to accept that. But once people know the reason for something, I feel like it's a lot easier to convince them to like come on the journey with you. I think also if you, if you are able to portray that in yourself, which does take time, it doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, accepting that this is what I have. This is what I, who I am and how I am. And it's okay. I'm really okay with me. I'm okay with me. And if you, I find that if I'm able to project that, um, I'm better accepted by my family. Um, it worked better at work too. When I first started uh, walking or being in my wheelchair, nurse friends would come by and they'd say, Oh, I'm so sorry. You're in a wheelchair. When I really would have preferred to hear them say, Oh, look at you being proactive and advocating for yourself, which is how I responded. You know, this has helped me tremendously. I can get to meetings. I can walk, you know, do my walking that I need to do in my job. And I'm not exhausted by 10 o'clock in the morning. It's really very, very helpful. So, Working on myself first, helping myself to accept um, that this is reality. This is what I am, and I'm still a good person. I still have value, and I still matter. And I'm still capable. And I'm still right. able to do and all of those. I can do my job. I can be a mother. I can be a grandmother. Um, I can be a good person. Um, it took a while. It was not overnight. It was not easy whatsoever. But it has helped tremendously. Yeah, you know, and just as a plug, through the FSHD Society, there's uh, all of the Connect meetings. You know, there's the Wellness Hour, which uh, is, you know, a very large group of adults that Renee is a, a leader of um, amongst some other people to, you know, bring different topics all related to how it is that we negotiate these things and maintain independence and do everything. Renee is also, um, you know, coordinating and guiding um, the women on wellness group, which is specific issues for women. There's a young people's uh, group, young professionals group for people with FSHD. Marissa, I'm not sure if you're part of that. And Isaac, um, you know, is involved uh, in running the caregivers, the caregiver hour, um, along uh, with Sue Drescher. Um, I think you guys are still doing that together. Um, Sue is doing that now. Sue's doing it now. Yeah. So there are a lot of these these avenues for support where maybe again like I, I don't know that today we solved all of the problems no in fact i know we did not solve all of the problems of communication and, and that really wasn't the intention but um there's something incredibly powerful when you hear someone who has got a story similar than similar to you or a story that's different from you where there's something that you can gain something from and learn something from or just to know that you're sort of not alone i i just I also want to say, you know, I, I know we're sort of over time, but I, I, I had the um, amazing experience and privilege of being able to go to the Real Abilities um, Film Festival in New York 
city the other week where the film uh, Good Bad Things was being um, played, which was writ co-written by and star starred in by someone oh. with FSHD. Yes. And, yeah, I know the FSHD Society have been posting about it. I hope that people get to see this because it's the, the, the title itself is Good Bad Things. And what's meant by that is these bad, these things, these bad things, these uncomfortable conversations, these situations we have to put ourselves in that don't feel good, that are hard, but that are good for us. That what happens when we, when we actually allow ourselves to be uncomfortable and face these difficult things uh, that ultimately can help us to live in a way that's that more um, consistent with what matters to us and fulfilling. Um, and I think it speaks a lot to kind of what we're talking about today too. So I'd encourage everybody to see when it's at a film festival near them. Jen, I saw somebody ask to explain the term bifocal. So if I have 30 seconds, I can oh, do it oh, again. Yeah. Yeah. So what we meant was the fact that in every communication, if we use bifocal lens, means that I'm always thinking about what I need in this relationship, but also I'm thinking about what does the other person need. So I'm always looking at what do I need and how do I express it in a way that lands well on the other side? So this is the bifocal vision. Uh, we want to see how the other person can hear us. We don't put the other person on the defensive. And that relates to June's story. And I'm going to tie it in. You know, the person who wrote the story about the difficulty with, with her parents, sometimes if you just are able to create a safe space for your parents and you say, Mom, Dad, I don't expect you to do anything differently now. I just want you to hear me. Mm -hmm. And it, I think people may feel, if you use bifocal vision, the other people, you are seeing that they are afraid, they are not going to know what to do, how to respond, and you are just alleviating their worry. And you are saying, it's okay. I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to listen to me and you speak in non-blaming terms. Um, there is a lot about that in our book. People ask what the name, the title of the book that Aura and I wrote. It's called How People Matter. Why it affects health, happiness, love, work, and society. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we're slightly over time. It's, I just wanted to mention also something that came up earlier in the conversation about compassion. And Aura has spoken with the women's women on wellness group about compassion. So part of that is, you know, we're often our own harshest critics. Like we really lambast, you know, I can't do this or I shouldn't be able to do this. I didn't, you know. So there's that being compassionate for what, you know, where you are, but also when I'm thinking about her, this person with her parents who can't talk, I, I feel like it's important to extend compassion to a parent who is so in fear. I, I think all you can say is it must come from a place of fear that she can't talk about it and to have to carry that as a burden, your life is hard. And maybe there's a way to have a rapprochement with you come from a place of compassion, I'm thinking. And also compassion for yourself, but, and because there's a lot of grief mm -hmm. when you're going through something, not being able to have the support of your parents as well. So it's, again, mm -hmm. it's both. It's, you know, compassion for your parents that people don't cut off from this thing if it isn't something that's so overwhelming. And then compassion for ourselves that, it's okay to still want and need that. Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, how is it that I engage in the things that are gonna help me feel empowered and help me find the way through this? Yeah. Not letting it um, stop you. Yeah. yeah.
a couple of questions in the in the chat that haven't yeah. been answered yet. And yeah. one of them is the book that um, Jennifer mentioned. And I wrote the title of it, but I didn't catch the author. The oh, title Byron was Katie. Loving What Is. Loving What Is. Byron Katie is. Okay. is. It sounds like it should be Katie Byron, but it's not. It's Byron. Byron Katie. Okay. And then there's one other question that important question that someone has about their daughter uh, was genetically tested when she was around eight the results were inconclusive she's now 20 she wants to know should she get tested again she does not have any symptoms yet and i hesitate to answer that because that's a june question yeah yeah, yeah i think yeah, we I can we can take that question offline um and, and okay. i can on to you, Janet. Um, okay, and gonna... they left they left their email address there too. Correct. Um, so we'll be in touch about that shortly. Okay, great. Just didn't want it to get missed. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just really wanted I really wanted to thank everyone, it's particularly you know you know June for pulling this together and um, the FSHD Society for always giving us these these opportunities to speak together, but mm. also everyone on on this panel. Like I feel like we should do this on. A more regular basis is such an amazing group of people and i love how everyone communicates from their unique perspective and learning from one another and it's just i'm really grateful for it well i think we absolutely will have more conversations like this as you said we have these regular monthly meetings which are a place to share these stories and um and of course we can also have one that's specifically focused maybe another webinar on a regular basis but this was in a way an experiment for us to do a round table like this and i thank you all so much for um being brave and jumping in <laughs> with both feet and to, to and to share your stories so and thank you jennifer for being a wonderful yes. Yes. thanks Jen. thank you for facilitating thank you, mm -hmm. thank you for asking We'll see you again somewhere, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Take care so much, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye. Be safe Bye -bye. out there. Bye.